The question here is, is it all about money when negotiation? Looking at some statistics on what makes at least IT customers happy, uh, the last thing on the bottom during delivery was was the cost. Actually, uh, the the quality of the delivery and and uh, the relationships between the key people were way more important than than uh, than the cost. But of course, first then you have to pass the um, so you negotiate about money. It's not money uh, that will make you happy in the delivery. Where in the organization is that true? I would suspect that that might be true at the C-level of an organization, but I would strongly suspect that someone would uh, very closely manage and uh, grade a project manager if they missed on time or they missed on cost. I think you're right in a way. So I've been in a situation where we offered something to the customer at a very, very good price and uh, very high quality. And someone else offered something at half the price, obviously not very high quality. And uh, and the, let's say, lower level manager said, well, you know, the regulations are, I have to pick the cheaper one because it's it's 50% off your price. I know it's not going to be as good. I know it's it's not going to be nearly as good, but um, you know I have to pick it as the cheapest one. So the way it's measured in, in that particular sense. Ether, how are they how are they defining quality in that in that circumstance? Precisely, it, it it really totally depends on the individual tender. So what they will do is they'll look at the requirements, see, decide as a multivariate whether or not it does match uh, on a standard liquor scale um, the requirement. Um, well, badly, not at all, etc. cetera, um, score on five, and then they'll have some weighting associated with it. So it's a weighted factor model, and then you multiply one by the other and just sum the results, and that gives you a quality score. And then you have a, 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 a ratio, if you like, of what your te- tender value is relative to the priced tender, and then they combine the two in some form, either as a, as a product or as a sum. So, yeah. so. How can you uh, write the contracts for innovation or creativity? But part of it is, is stuff we already do know, in which case we use um, what's called in the agile space consumer-driven contracts. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, where you basically write what is effective an acceptance test. And everybody opts for that. And that acceptance testing examples within it. So we try to understand exactly what that is. If we can't write it at the beginning, we give the format and the expectation. And what we do is we say, this is your budget. That's what you've stated that you want to pay. And you've got to understand that we don't know uh, what we want. And in fact, you guys don't know what you want um, in a very sugared pill, if that makes any sense. And then it's slightly more complicated um, because from that perspective, nobody knows exactly what they want. They want something innovative, but actually the nature of themselves um, mean that it's difficult to become to allow them to be innovative because the actual tender post itself isn't very innovative. So you've got to put in a standard. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about the, you know innovation clauses. Yeah. Because every major contract has an innovation clause. Precisely. Yeah. What, what does that mean to you? It's very difficult because from our, because when you have an innovate, innovation clause, believe it or not, sometimes we've even said to people, well, actually, part and parcel of this innovation might be to rethink the way you tender stuff. Because we, that's that's a freebie we often give out to them because realistically, sometimes they've got themselves into a bit of a mess as far as the tender itself is concerned. Um, but what we you can't measure that because you can be quite innovative, but you don't know how the market's going to take it. If you don't have control of how you present it to the market, then of course you, you don't the, the end-to-end value or alignment with the with the customer's needs actually are. So that becomes a very difficult exercise. So from our perspective, what we tend to do is try to, as much as possible, give them the flexibility to work within it, but they have to understand that what they may get may not be valuable to them. And that's but the, that, that's often a very, very, very difficult sell, and procurement will not buy that in the most vast majority of cases. So yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with either on that. And in the states, at least, more more times than not, um, innovation clauses, innovation pieces, are tend to be carved out separately. Mm-hmm. Um, if if work is going out as innovation work, it tends to be uh, 
farmed out to a far smaller pool. It tends not to be put out to bid. It tends to be put into a pool where there is a significantly higher trust level. And most of that's TNM kind of work. Um, you know, investigation, you know, looking for a drug. I mean, the answer is you don't know what you're going to get. Albeit when, when people are attempting to do that at the same time in systems, right? They're attempting to do a piece of known work and a piece of unknown work. Those two things tend to be carved out separately with separate clauses and separate measurements. You know, you can, you can look at a piece of work to deliver a, a commercial off-the-shelf kind of product, all known, right, or relatively well-known. Obviously, you're still going to have trouble. But if you're going to then, on top of that, take and rewrite the entire business processes, which which is going to be much you know much more innovative, you know that'll tend to be carved out separately, and the feedback loops for that will be fundamentally smaller, so that so that people will know where it's at and whether they're going to get value for that. So one of the things that we suggest and and very strongly stand on is that when when the outcome is the thing that's unknown. You know, roughly that feedback loop has got to be fundamentally smaller. And every feedback loop, every time you go through that loop, you have to have an out. And both sides can blow it up at the at the end of every feedback loop or at the end of every X number of feedback loops, two, four. You know, it depends if you'd like if you're doing safe or something like that. It might be four or five. But but you have to have an out, and everyone, it's like the old Toyota production line, right? So everyone gets to pull the chain and say the line stops, and that way, that way, you have you you help build in some of that trust into that contract. I think that's an excellent way to go about it. To be fair, and the difficulty, but but there, there's uh, of course the the innovation that kind of external innovation, new products or or new ways of presenting products and so on. But there's also the kind of relentless improvements to the delivery as such, improving something every day, some every week, every month in the delivery and making things just a little bit better. We generally uh, and and the contracts that I've definitely been involved in tend not to look at that as innovation. That's mm -hmm. table stakes into the game of outsourcing. And, and having, having been on many bid teams and as an advisor to very large integrators, most of them look at that as, you know, that's, that's unfortunately where the lawyers and the bid team who, who probably haven't delivered a day in their life uh, get involved in writing those contracts. And you see, See, you see seals that say you will have a 10% productivity uh, gain across every year of this contract. And if you don't, there, here's the mock penalties kind of thing that goes along with that. that. That in at least a lot of the outsourcing world, that's not innovation. That's table stakes. The intent is to drive down the cost of that contract.